Hey, Walter Sorrell's back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, excavating the secret history of a tool. So I'm a tool junkie, probably like a lot of you guys, and today I'll be talking about a very humble but pretty interesting tool, a pair of vintage Utica chain nose pliers. But I'll also be talking about the man who owned them. So the 20th anniversary of my father-in-law's death rolled around this month. And coincidentally, my wife and I were helping to move my wife's 98-year-old mother to a care facility, which meant cleaning out her apartment and, you know, storage area where she had all these family things. And uh, among them was this ammo can full of tools that had been owned by my father-in-law. Most of them, not very interesting tools, but this pair of pliers caught my eye for a variety of reasons. So I thought I'd take a look at them and kind of unpack some things about this particular tool. So this is a pair of Utica Drop Forge and Tool Company Model 226S long chain nose pliers forged in Utica, New York, probably, though I'm not dead sure of this, in the late 1940s. You can see indications of some of that stamped into the steel here around the pivot. Close-up view of the other side reveals something interesting. It's stamped bell system. What's that all about? We'll get to that in a minute. First, let's talk about the pliers. All right, so the Utica Drop Forge and Tool Company was founded in Utica, New York in 1895. The company was responsible for a bunch of kind of small innovations in the design of pliers, including handle checkering and some new types of pliers, and a feature that was unique to this particular line of pliers that I'll be talking about uh, in a minute. Now, as far as the name of the company goes, uh, drop forging is a production forging method where you have these big, huge drop hammers and big dies, and you put usually a big piece of steel in there, and you'll drop it into often a closed die system and form the shape of that particular um, you know, whatever it might be, hammer, pliers, anything. Anyway, the company produced uh, a very broad line of tools, but kind of their specialty or their main focus was pliers. Like a great many American industrial companies, you know, it kind of got uh, absorbed into other companies eventually, you know, the usual thing. So the brand and the factory and all of that of the Utica Drop Forge company is gone to the wayside. Now, let's turn to this guy. This bright-eyed looking young guy is my father-in-law. This would have been taken probably back in the early 40s, Al Hughes. Al was born in New York City and grew up in Hollis, Queens, home of Run DMC, Ja Rule, Russell Simmons, LL Cool J, and Al Sharpton. Pretty sure my father-in-law did not know any of those guys, but anyway, here he is. Second lieutenant in the Army, just back from serving in the Signal Corps in Korea, standing next to his wife, my mother-in-law. Now, other than those two years in the U.S. Army, my father-in-law worked for precisely one employer in his entire life, New York Telephone. After graduating from Manhattan College with an electrical engineering degree, he started out as a management trainee, which back in those days meant you went out and you worked as a telephone installer or a lineman or whatever for probably up to a couple years. Now, interestingly, Al's father, my wife's grandfather, had also spent his entire career as a phone installer in New York City. Here he is shown with the installers in his group at the phone company. So anyway, it's not unlikely that Al Hughes picked up this pair of pliers at that time when he was a trainee out there working in the field, late 40s, early 50s. Possible they were even owned by his dad. Not sure. Now, background. For you youngsters out there, at one time, the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, AT&T, founded originally, of course, by good old Alexander Graham Bell was one of the largest companies in the world. I mean, it still is, but I mean, it was like the Amazon or Microsoft of its era. Huge, dominant, top of the technology food chain. I mean, just a giant. 
Now, AT&T ran the long distance business of the phone business in the United States, but it also had all these subsidiary companies that ran the local phone service. New York Telephone, which later became 9X, Southern Bell, which became Bell South, Pacific Bell, all these what they call baby bells, plus tons of other companies like the famous Bell Labs, where the transistor, you know, the basis of all modern computing and electronics was invented. Hey guys, let me jump in here to mention that if you've been enjoying the channel for any of the past 15 years that I've been doing this on YouTube, uh, and you want to keep helping us to help you, you can make it happen on Patreon. Now, not only do you get the good feeling of supporting something that you like and that you value, but you also get access to plans for just tons of the builds that I've done over the past many, many years on YouTube. All right, guys, back to work. So back in those days, the phone company actually owned the phone in your home. And so if you wanted a phone, you called up the phone company, an installer came, he'd go into your house, drill holes, staple wire wherever he wanted to go, and then he would stick a black rotary phone on a table somewhere. So anyway, that's what Al Hughes' uh, dad spent his life doing, and that's what Al started his career doing. And so for that, you needed pliers. Now, you'll notice that unlike that pair of needle nose pliers that you bought last week down at Home Depot, this pair of pliers does not have a wire cutting feature. Instead, it has these two little grooves. So let's turn to the 1950 Utica Drop Forge and Tool catalog, where we'll see that your Model 226 pliers come in several different submodels, I guess you'd call them including this, the S model, with S standing for sleeve, or sleeve groove. All right, let's back up again. Back when young Al Hughes was still dragging wire through, uh, you know, apartments in Manhattan and all that stuff, the basis of telephony was this right here. This is called a twisted pair. It's two pieces of wire, little sleeves on the wire, and, uh, you know, they're twisted together, I guess, to reduce... Uh, RF interference or whatever so that the phones wouldn't hum. So, you know, the basic idea was that you could use those two little slots to grab hold of the wire and then yank it through a hole in the wall of, you know, an apartment in Queens or whatever as you're installing the telephone. So, what we can assume here is that the Bell system, using their huge purchasing power, probably ordered giant piles of pliers from Utica and had them stamped with the Bell name at the factory, then distributed them to their linemen and installers. Now, this particular pair of pliers is one of Utica's lube ring models. It includes a patented system whereby a little slot was milled out of the interior of the pliers into which a porous cast iron ring was inserted. So because it's porous, the ring absorbs oil. And then over time, that oil is going to kind of wick back out into the joint, which presumably assures many years of smooth operation. And in fact, look at that, smooth as glass. And these things probably haven't been oiled in, you know, three decades. One of the features of the Bell system was that reliability was always, always king. Everything they did was intended to make sure that your phone worked all the time. It was a monopoly, and part of the culture was that it was their responsibility to do everything right. So, you worked for Bell, you got the Cadillac pliers, the ones that cost $3.35, not those $2.10 model 654s. That's how the Bell system rolled. So, most likely, Al absconded with these pliers, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. So... My father-in-law was a very correct kind of guy. Uh, he was not the sneak off with the company stapler type of guy. Not saying it didn't happen, but it really wasn't his style. Which leads me to these. Check this out. Protruding from the pivot pin of these pliers are these tiny little studs or pins. I wasn't even sure what to call them when I first looked at it. Now, I was really curious about this. I've seen a lot of tools in my life, never seen anything quite like this. 
One important clue, though, is that they actually stick out. You can feel them. Now, why does that matter? Well, typically when you manufacture pliers, the two sides of the pliers are pinned together and the pivot is compressed or smashed, you know, riveted essentially into place. And then the whole side of the pliers is ground flush. So if these pins had been added during manufacturing, they would have been ground down flush and you wouldn't be able to feel them, which indicates that these pins were actually added later. Now, I couldn't even see it until I magnified this, but what you'll notice is that some kind of tiny little channel has been filed or scored or milled or broached into the pivot hole. So I believe what happened was that this pair of pliers had actually worn out as they were used over the years dragging cable around New York City. And so there's slop developing in the handle and they probably sent them to a Bell System refurb shop or maybe even back to Utica and the pivot was then repaired. So they would have driven the pin out and then these four tiny channels would have been filed or however they made them into this hole. And then four tiny pieces of wire, maybe steel, but maybe, you know, something kind of funky like Monel metal or some other softer bearing type metal, then would have been slipped in these little channels as the new pin was then inserted and smashed back into place with an arbor press or hydraulic press or whatever. And honestly, the more I've looked at this little close-up, the more I start to think maybe my whole theory here is wrong, that actually those what look like little pieces of wire or something sticking up is actually just part of the metal of the pliers themselves it's been driven up when a punch was punched in there to tighten them up so maybe I'm overcomplicating the whole thing anyway presto like new you've taken the play out of that pivot nice and tight and smooth again now I've seen other instances of this general idea sort of staking them by hammering them with a punch or things like that but I've never seen something exactly like this Anyway, if anybody knows more about this type of repair than I do, by all means, leave a comment below. It's pretty cool. Okay, so anyway, here I'm just completely speculating, but I wouldn't be surprised if the Bell system, after fixing these things, then sold the refurbs to employees on the cheap. Some companies do that. Again, you know, maybe Al just slipped them in his pocket one day, or maybe his dad did. These things happen, but somehow, anyway, this pair of Bell System pliers found its way into this ammo can where they would have been used around the Hughes family home for another few decades. Now, let me add a few notes about my father-in-law. I'm not going to say he was the world's handiest guy. Um, you know, he may have started out installing phones in Brooklyn, dragon wire, whatever, but he got an MBA from uh, NYU in the 50s and spent most of his career in finance, ending up as the head budget guy for uh, New York Telephone, uh, which probably had become 9X by that point. You can see him here in this picture. Uh, this is a press photo produced by the press department of New York Telephone. Anyway, he was famous, uh, inside his family anyway, for maybe being a little over-reliant on, uh, on persuading things with a hammer. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe there was a reasonable amount of cursing thrown in there, too, uh, when he was doing his home improvement projects. But still, you know, he was a guy who knew what it was like to work with his hands, uh, and so he had this ammo can full of tools that were sitting right there in his apartment uh, till, the, till the day he died. Anyway, you look at a pair of these, they're forged by American workers out of American steel, they're lovingly repaired in American workshops at an American company, and they're owned by a young American man who'd spent two years setting up military communication systems on cold mountains in Korea. So thank you to everybody who touched these pliers over the years. I'm even going to say thank you to the pliers themselves. I mean, how many Americans were able to, you know, call their moms when they, when they needed some encouragement or call the police department when they were threatened or in danger or whatever? Um, you know, how many people called their boss to tell them that a baby was on the way? All those things happened because this pair of pliers was there to pull that wire and set up those phones. 
So sometimes it's good to take a minute to be grateful for what got us to where we are today. So thank you Utica Drop and Forge Company Model 226S. Thank you Al Hughes. Thank you for your service. Thanks for watching guys. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe and make sure that you click on that bell so you get notified of all the latest videos. Want to buy a knife from me? Check out my modern blades at tacticsarmory.com. Digging the channel? You can support our video making efforts on Patreon. You know, I've been banging away on these videos for like 10 years. So I hope you'll show some love for all that hard work. Link in the cards and descriptions. Finally, if you're interested in making Japanese swords, check out my full line of Japanese sword videos where I show how to forge Japanese swords as well as how to polish them and how to make fittings, handles, and scabbards. WalterSorrelsBlades.com